Where do you see the intersection between climate change, health and security? For some time, I th we, we've recognised that climate change poses a number of threats to um, our way of life uh, and our livelihood. Uh, we've looked at the environmental, we've looked at the health, the socio-economic, but increasingly there's a recognition also that it potentially presents a challenge to global stability and our well-being. And by that I mean I, it's not that climate change in itself is like to start a conflict, but the impact of the second and third order consequences, when people lose their land, their livelihood, what do they do? Do they migrate? Do they migrate within a country, between countries? Is it organised or is it chaos? Does it cause tension? Or if they have no livelihood, do they find something which is legal or, some, or are they vulnerable to recruiting into organised crime or even terrorism? Why is it a problem for us here in Northern Europe and perhaps the areas in the world where this is more likely to happen are further afield? Well, there's a band that runs around the world, uh, uh, centred on the equator, where there's already problems with health, food shortages, water shortages, demographic challenges, and we've seen conflict there in the past. Conflict is partly due to the results of the governments in those countries not necessarily having the capacity and resilience to deal with it. That in itself is a challenge, but that's where climate change is going to have its greatest effect. It's also where the world's trade routes run. We're a globalised society. We're all dependent on trade of some form or other, imports, exports, and uh, in particular for us in Europe, energy, but also food and other goods coming from the Middle East and further afield. Same for China, 75% of their oil goes through the Malacca Straits. So we've got a global problem, which is potentially going to affect global stability. And you've been uh, in the conference all day today, obviously. I know you're, you're looking to write the summary now. What's come out of it so far, do you think? Well, I think what's come out of it is we've, we've learnt a lot. I've certainly learnt a lot, and that's why we have events like this. I think we've recognised the challenge. We've reaffirmed in our minds what that threat is. We've reaffirmed we need to do something, but perhaps at the same time we, we have been somewhat reluctant to get engaged, or we found factors that have stopped us. Um, the reality is we need to get on and do something, and we need to do it now. We won't have 100% certainty about this risk or this threat. We don't have for any threat. But we know enough to make a judgment of where it sits in our priorities and the need to take action. And the action we really need to do is to try and build global stability and capacity in order to deal with these challenges and reduce the risks of our instability in parts, other parts of the world and, and ensure that they have the basic natural resources that they need. And what kind of steps do you envisage military and health professionals taking? Well, I think we can talk with our own professionals. A message from someone in your own profession comes much better than from someone outside. So I look for all the, those in the health community here and those in the military community to continue to talk about what we need to do, but talk about the opportunities, not just the threats, but also the opportunities. And in a language that the, the audience understands, it focuses on these issues that concern them and also their values and what they want in, in, in the future. Um, from a military perspective, the sort of things we're looking at is, um, as well as what it means for our missions and tasks and making sure that we can play our part in building um, the capacity and resilience around the world in conflict prevention. We can also look at, see, at where our vulnerabilities are, for example, in the way we use energy. Uh, we need energy, we will always need fossil fuels, and we always need to have a war fighting capability. But we also need to be alert to the fact that there are other sources of energy and we need to be more energy efficient and make sure that when we're developing our capabilities and our ability to do our business, that we do so in a fashion which is not only meets the needs we have, but reduces the risk to the environment. And the military, I know, has actually led on a lot of um, climate change initiatives or, or um, kind of transitions to renewable energy. What's the motivation? We need to be more effective, we need to reduce risk, and we need to reduce our costs. And are you seeing the impacts of climate change affecting your operations already, or is this something for the future? I think already, whilst... The military globally are seeing that already. Um, we're seeing more extreme weather events, uh, more intense, more frequent events, and that's required the military to provide humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Now, it would be a brave man who attributed all of that to climate change, but it's certainly a factor in the process, whether it be in Pakistan or elsewhere. Thanks very much for speaking to us. It's been really interesting to talk to you. Pleasure. Thank you very much.